Hello everyone, this is Elias Martin of Collecting Japanese Prints. Welcome to Woodblock Wednesday, where every Wednesday we get together and discuss Japanese prints, paintings, history, and culture. Today's Woodblock Wednesday is actually focused on a theme as opposed to an artist. And um, I thought it would be neat to take two prints, um, there are two woodblock prints produced by western artists that were working in japan um but they in and they certainly had their own body of work where with different ideas about what they were looking at but um i pulled two different prints um with the same subject or the same theme so that we could have a look at them and maybe see some nuances and some similarities or differences if there are any and then also talk about the motif in general um, you know, throughout Japanese print history or Japanese art. So without further ado, let's go to the table and see what I have. So I'm going to back up a little bit. It's a little dark today. It looked, uh, for some reason, I think there's, some, there's a shadow. Uh, there's a big cloud overhead. And so it's casting, you know, my, in my, this is sort of my viewing room and the lights are coming in from, from the light is coming in from the window and it's slightly dark in here so I hope that we're able to look at these um, quite carefully but uh, anyway both prints are by Western artists as, as I mentioned this first print is by Fritz Capillari and he um, was Austrian traveled to Japan and he was one of the first Shinhanga artists uh, hired by Watanabe. In fact, some people argue that he was the first Shinhanga artist, and Watanabe then later added uh, Japanese artists to his uh, stable of artists. But Kapilari was certainly one of the first. And, um, you know, he, he was in Japan um, in the about 1910 through about the 20. Well, he I think he left before the, the 20s, or before the earthquake, I think he left. But the the or right right around that time but the point is this design was originally done in 1915 and it depicts a group of it looks like women walking um through the rain and the title uh, as i said is returning home in the rain um and um the print really features uh the figures walking through the rain but the the main sort of motif is the umbrellas, which is really beautiful. And, um, and so these umbrellas um, are done with different colors. Uh, they invoke different textures. They're all sort of made out of paper, I think, but they're, they're done um, sort of, uh, and in some ways they, they echo a, a textile motif. So they have sort of repeating colors um, and so, you know, it's a very highly decorative design. And, you know, just to back up a little bit, I could show you the other work we'll be discussing. And this print is by Lillian Miller. And this design is known by the, uh, the title Rain Blossom, Japan B, 1928. And the reason why this, this print is titled B is that she has two versions of this print, uh, one in a slightly different coloration. And so this is the B version. Uh, but before we get into the designs, I want to talk about the motif of umbrellas. And there's a wonderful book. I, I believe Julia Meach um, was the editor of this book. And there's some really interesting essays. It's called rain and snow the umbrella in japanese art and this book um which I, I i believe i have a copy in my bookstore available for sale um highlights first of all they discuss you know how how these traditional paper umbrellas are made which is kind of cool and and then different motifs within the umbrellas and 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 then just basically there's some fantastic woodblock prints that are illustrated um, that feature this motif. And this is a book that, uh, you know, it's actually slightly obscure um, as books go. You don't see it all that often, but I highly recommend it. Now, this is a ghost. 
that basically is here let me move my phone but it, he's manifesting through this umbrella which is kind of cool um you know just flipping through this here's a beautiful hasui of a of a, fi a figure i think a woman walking up into a temple um you know and, and of course the essays are well really informative but the images are really striking and you really get to see how how different artists from different periods uh treated the motif of umbrellas and um you know i think that's valuable so here let me just flip through these uh through these pages quickly and so you know to say a few words uh, the way that umbrellas were used in various different prints, um, you know, I could cite different examples. We could go on and on all day about it. But they were certainly used as a motif in Japanese prints. Sometimes uh, they conveyed um, a way to, to create sort of a psychological sort of atmosphere. There were some umbrellas and some designs that were broken or cracked. Um, there's a design of a Yoshitoshi print that comes to mind, which probably is in that book. I flipped through it quickly. But the point is, it showed the frailty of the, of the woman's uh, psychology or her mental state. And the, the, the umbrella really echoed that. There's other umbrellas that just echo the decorative element of the design, like that Hasui we saw. And then also, the, the, they're symbolic. Um, I don't know if, uh, if, if you're not aware, in Japan, um, the umbrella, the sign of the, or the symbol of the umbrella is used to sort of illustrate lovers. Or like in the United States, you, you sometimes see a heart um, shaped with two initials um, as, you know, and so that's pretty common here in, in the United States. But in Japan, you have an umbrella with the initials of each person on each side of the the handle which suggests you know lovers and so you know there's a really interesting sort of tradition around the umbrella and these western artists that traveled to japan were encountering this tradition and how decorative these umbrellas and the motifs um, were throughout japanese um, history and, you know, these two were early Shinhanga artists, particularly Kapilari. And Kapilari was looking at Edo period prints for inspiration, but he was also bringing his own Western sensibilities into sort of uh, into the fray. And so, you know, this print is considered one of his masterpieces. I, I would argue his, his best print. And it strikes me as certainly Japanese, but it also reminds me of French posters of of the period or maybe even slightly before this. And so, yeah, French posters of the turn of the century. Um, and so this design does have those Western sensibilities to it. The other thing I think that both of these artists are, are doing is we don't see the figures. We, we, we barely see the figures, and it's what, what we see are the umbrellas. And the umbrellas stand in place for the figure. And, um, for example, in Miller's print, um, we see that each umbrella is very different, either in color, in shape, or in construction. And the umbrellas take on a personality all their own, and the composition and how they're sort of arranged throughout also suggests movement. And we see the umbrellas and, and the figures moving up towards the bridge. Uh, and so this design actually reminds me of a Karhu print where he just, he just laid out umbrellas going across a uh, landscape and it wasn't there weren't any people it was just umbrellas and so you know I, I i find this kind of fascinating and how you know the conversation um between something that's very japanese and then these western artists taking on that subject and sort of using it as a device to produce work um of their own and so sort of moving back to this capillary print, I just want to discuss the printing. 
This is a pre-earthquake design, meaning that it was produced in Watanabe's print shop before the earthquake when, you know, arguably many collectors and scholars have, uh, have um, argued that at that time it was the height of Watanabe's printmaking abilities and some of the most important uh, designs were produced before the earthquake and it wasn't just the designs it was also the printing quality that set them apart and so if we look at this we could see how saturated the colors are and how beautiful the bokashi and the different printing effects you get within this relatively small composition you know you you get a different texture in this blue kimono here uh, that's quite nice um, and then, of course, as I mentioned, this red, deep red, that you see the beren strokes um, around on the, the kimono, which serves to echo the, the falling rain coming in at an angle. I mean, it's, this design is so lyrical, so subtle and beautiful. It's masterful. And, and I just, it's one of my favorite Shinhanga prints, period. So I just thought I'd show you the reverse so you could see the impression of the umbrellas and the bleed through. It, it, when, you, when you look at this design, especially from the back, it, it almost strikes me as almost abstract. You, you have these sort of these circles, it's basically these ovals and then these rectangles um, and then color. So it's a very simple composition but quite striking and 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 very memorable it's one of those designs that i can think of immediately and and, and i could and see it in my mind's eye it's so iconic and so in this design um the artist lillian miller ch uh, chose to spread out the figures to give uh, as i said a sense of movement and the rain is coming at a slightly different angle coming from this side. Um, but, you know, it's, it's a beautifully, beautifully printed um, design. The color around the figures is done with this beautiful bokashi that suggests that, uh, that, a, that moments before really strong um, downpour. So when the sky is kind of a yellowish brown, um, you could kind of just see the ominous quality, but it's also luminous and poetic and beautiful. I should point out, in addition to this great book on umbrellas throughout Japanese print history, this book, Eyes Towards Asia, is an exhibition catalog. I, I, I have this book for sale, um, and it showcases all Western artists working in Japan that focused on printmaking. And so, of course, we have Fritz Capillari, Miller, Hyde, Bartlett, Brown, Lum, Keith, Jacquelet, Orlick, who was oftentimes the teacher of many of these artists. And you, I mean, I'm just gonna flip through this, but this is an excellent catalog. And there we are, we have the design that we're looking at in the catalog here. But this is a great, great book. And, of course, this is the catalog to an exhibition of Lillian Miller prints. Uh, this was authored by Ken Brown, uh, the leading Shinhanga scholar. And uh, inside the dust jacket, we have the print, again, illustrated um, in the book. And the book is, has an amazing um, essay and then images about the artist. And, of course, the catalog also illustrates many of Miller's prints. I don't think it's complete, but it's near complete, and it's basically the only catalog resume of her work out right now. So, you know, I just wanted to point those things out. I always like to show the, the books that relate to the prints, but I've spoken quite a bit, and I just now want to zoom in on both prints for you uh, to enjoy. In the bottom here, we have Capillari's signature. Um, it is dated in the image, 1915,
but they they were printing them throughout um, the years, and it's dated on the print 1920. So um, it clearly was done right in five within the five years when the design was produced by Watanabe. But as far as I know, the blocks for this print were destroyed in Watanabe's shop when the earthquake and the ensuing fires basically destroyed a good chunk of Tokyo, including his shop. In fact, the, the, the earthquake and fires not just not only destroyed the Watanabe print, uh, print shop, it also, I think, two of his printers um, perished um, in the fires. And that is one of the explanation as to why the quality of printmaking in his shop um, was not as um, strong as it was before the earthquake. Uh, two of his master printers died, and if we if we think about what it, it, what it means to be a master printmaker, a printer, you know, to be an apprentice to be a printer would require twenty years of apprenticeship. And then you can claim to be a master printmaker or a printer. And so, you know, to, to have two people lost that w already went through 20 years of apprenticeship is a huge loss. Now, he, he still had staff to produce prints, but you know, it gives you a sense of what was lost and why possibly some of the quality of his prints um, I, I won't say suffered, but they, uh, to my eye, pre-earthquake Hasui's and other pre-earthquake impressions by Watanabe just have a depth of printing and a color um, and, sof and sophistication that I think is l slightly lacking after the earthquake. So I'll just put that out there, and, and it's just my opinion. Um, you might feel differently, and if you do, feel free to comment below. I'd love to hear what your thoughts um, about Watanabe's prints post-earthquake might um, look like to you. But uh, this design is, is one of those iconic designs done in that early period of printmaking in, in Watanabe's shop. Now, moving along to Miller's print, I want to zoom in and show you the, the detail. This design really does a wonderful job at capturing these nuances that we've all come to love about Japan. We have this willow tree that's coming down, that's echoing the, the wind and the rain. And then we have here this post that belongs to part of the bridge with the metal um, top uh, or cap on there. You know, you see these bridges in Kyoto quite a bit. Um, they're still there, and so this architecture has been part of Japanese um, history for, for centuries. And this is a very typical wooden um, structure that you, you'll see in Kyoto if you go to Japan, which I encourage you to do at some point. And so this design, you know, echoes Japanese architecture, the, the sort of the, the aesthetic of the whipping, weeping willow on the bridge, which is something you see in Japan, in Kyoto in particular. And then, of course, these wonderful figures walking through the rain with their beautiful umbrellas. I, I particularly like this one. You have the motif here. Um, there's flowers. Uh, it's just, just a beautiful design. You know, and, and just to compare these two a bit, I found I find this one more introspective, more contemplative, partly because sort of the, the way that the umbrellas are, are positioned. It, and as I said, it, it has a, a, a more textile-like quality to it. I could kind of almost see this as a pattern in a textile. Whereas this one is a bit more playful and fun the, the the though we don't know who the figures are they're the 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 individuality of the of the umbrellas does suggest 
you know, that they're different people doing different things, going about their lives in different ways, which is, you know, I think really cool in how, you know, that's just communicated with just umbrellas. Uh, and in just also the, 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 the design being more open, that's also um, re- really interesting, quite nice. And so there's two very different perspectives um, by these two Western artists um, in you know, how they deal with a traditional subject of umbrellas. Now, one last thing before we go, um, I should point out that the variants, if I can find it in this book with one hand, let's see if I could do that. Um, it was produced with the same blocks. It was just colored differently, which is something that we, we'd we see for, from other artists like Hiroshi Yoshida is very well known. Oh, here we go. For producing different um, effects from the same blocks uh, to create different impressions and, and different light on on a design. So his his sailboats forenoon, for example, that design was done forenoon, morning, night, um, and, and and so on. I think there's six uh, in total. And so in this case, we have the same design done with just different colors to create a slightly different uh, effect. I mean. It's the blue is an interesting color, but in, in my opinion, I, th- I like the brownish kind of yellowish brown a bit more. Um, the colors of the umbrellas pop a bit more um, in contrast, but this is the, the fact that there's two to collect is great if you're a collector and, and you could put these side by side and, 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 no, and notice and enjoy the, the differences and the nuance between one impression to another. You know, that's that's what makes print, uh, print collecting enjoyable. At least to me, it, um, it, it is. I um, loved comparing impression to impression. So I wanted to show that because that, that is something that was interesting to Shin Hunga artists doing variants uh, of different colorations with the same blocks. But at the end of the day, uh, these two um, prints... Uh, with the same motif, really showcase different feelings. Um, and it's amazing how much, how different they, they feel um, when, when shown side by side. Well, I want to thank you for joining me in this week's installment of Whitblock Wednesday. I, um, I'm, I'm really happy to be able to, uh, to share these two wonderful designs with all of you. They're fantastic prints. Uh, uh, and so if you want to read a little bit more about them, both are on my website. Both are available, um, collectingjapaneseprints.com. The other thing um, I'd like to mention, it's sort of a... Uh, a preview is that I've, I'm uploading about 30 to 50 new um, books to the bookstore, including um, an exclusive uh, for uh, collecting Japanese prints. It is uh, George Mann, the famous uh, world-renowned ukiyo-e collector. He's written a memoir of his collecting. And uh, yeah, so I have the exclusive rights to offer the book. There's only 100 books for sale. So the email will go out at the end of this week about it. But if you're interested in, in reading his memoir, it's gorgeous. It's a gorgeous book. He, he, I think it's like 400 pages, full color, that illustrates the vast majority of his collection. And the book is really about his experience as a collector, his, his um, experiences with other collectors. And, you know, he talks about dinner parties that he attended with major collectors that were his senior. And, it, and it's sort of the, the story of how the baton was passed to him as a collector. So if you're interested in learning or reading about collectors and, and, and connoisseurship and, and just I, I think it's just a captivating, captivating read. 
um, it's a book that you should consider. Um, it's up on my website currently, and as I said, there's only about 100 books available for sale. So um, I don't think they'll last long. So anyway, thank you very much for joining us, and I look forward to seeing all of you next week at our next installment of Woodblock Wednesday. Until then, see you soon. Bye.